th thank you everyone welcome to uh, this well first joint seminar organized by uh, center on labor sustainability and global production at queen mary and the journal of agrarian change as part of the agrarian change um, seminar series which has actually been running continuously uh, since 2008, uh, well, by Jens <laughs> and who's here, and uh, well, now uh, by me and other, other colleagues. And we've run this in online or hybrid mode since uh, 2020, for those of you who are um, new here. So there's always an online option uh, now. Um, so this is, uh, so today's seminar is, um, so one thing I want to say uh, before starting is that uh, uh, this seminar is recorded and we and uh, like uh, our other seminars since uh, the past two, three years, uh, they're all on our YouTube channel. So if you, for some reason, uh, someone doesn't want to be uh, recorded, then uh, please, please, um, especially online, please put your comment on the chat. And obviously we might have to record your question if you're here, but we don't have to name you. So that should work out <laughs> somehow. Okay. So, um, so that was just by way of disclaimer. So today's, uh, for today's talk, we have, um, we would like to welcome Dr. Jaisalan Raj, uh, uh, who will be talking about his book, uh, Plantation Crisis. Uh, so Jaisalan is a senior lecturer of anthropology and development at King's College London and a fellow in the um, GRNPP uh, program at SOAS, which is on parliaments and global network on parliaments and people. Um, he's the author of, of course, Plantation Crisis, Ruptures of Dalit Life in the Indian Tea Belt, which came out last year from UCL Press. He's also the co-author of, uh, one of the co-authors of Ground Down by Growth, Tribe, Caste, Class and Inequality uh, in 21st Century India, uh, which came out uh, from Pluto Press in 2017. And his research and writings focus on the plantation system and uh, labor, caste, class, gender and ethnicity, agrarian capitalism and migration, uh, and the state and the Dalit question uh, in India. So um, over to you, Jessalyn. So we'll, we'll uh, Jessalyn will speak for about 40, 45, 50 minutes. We'll save all the questions uh, for later, if that's okay. And uh, yes, let's move further. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for this invitation. Um, Ens like is a friend and mentor, Shreya, and others at uh, uh, Queen Mary University and uh, also at SOAS. Um, so this is uh, not a seminar paper, but it's a book presentation. So I'm just going to present uh, my book, uh, Plantation Crisis. Um, so, Um, so, this uh, book emerged out of my PhD project and my postdoctoral projects at the London School of Economics, as well as University of Bergen, uh, where I did my PhD and also uh, went for a postdoctoral project. Um, so, the book um, deals with a particular kind of moment in plantation system. Uh, in which the workers who were reproduced as plantation workers over four or five generations move out of the plantations. And uh, this is not so unique. So in historically we have we, we, we know that you know one group of plantation workers are replaced by another group over over periods, uh, particularly that is evident in the Caribbean literature. But when it comes to the sort of, post-slavery plantations, the plantations which were established after the abolition of uh, slavery in the 1840s, um, and particularly through the intentuate system, what you find is that uh, the workers uh, were reproduced uh, for generations in, the, in those plantations, not only between 1840s and to 1950s, during this sort of colonial period, but even in the post-colonial period, in most context, uh, the workers were from the families uh, of indentured uh, workers. So the, the sort of workers I'm talking about is the descendants of uh, the indentured laborers. In this case, 
uh, who, uh, who are Tamil speaking Dalits. Okay, so Dalits is ex untouchable group who are located at the bottom of caste hierarchy in India. Uh, so they were brought from Tamil speaking regions in South India to another South Indian region uh, called Kerala. And, and this is uh, from uh, tea plantations. So my book deals with this major rupture and it's an ethnography, it's a very simple ethnography of what is happening to these workers uh, in this moment of rupture and how can we understand the crisis uh, through what I call as uh, a, a sort of a phenomenological uh, ethnography of crisis uh, by centering the workers themselves uh, beyond uh, the plantation, the concern for the plantation. So one of the critique that I provide in the book and I start with that critique is that in most often when we talk about crisis, we end up talking about economic crisis or financial crisis and the concern remains with the crisis, how to get out of the crisis. Um, and if it's particularly, let's say industrial crisis or economic crisis as they call it, uh, let's say on plantation, then we are mostly concerned about the commodity, right? Uh, you know what, what's you know what's happening to tea production and tea, tea market. Uh, what will happen to the labor market? And uh, then the concern for these workers, uh, even beyond understanding them as workers, uh, remains uh, at the margins in most contexts. Um, so here, I not only talk about what is happening outside uh, the plantations, outside the production relations to these workers in moments of crisis, but I try to relationally locate the plantation production and the life uh, within the plantations and life outside the plantations as I trace out these workers. So uh, methodologically, um, I try to approach this particular issue uh, through two things. One is kind of social network analysis to just follow the life of the workers within the plantations and as well as as they move out of the plantations in search of livelihood outside the plantation, uh, but also understanding the crisis as a situated event, taking it from the Manchester School of Anthropology, uh, Max Luckman, Clyde Mitchell, Bruce Kaffler and others uh, who talked about how to approach an event as a slice of reality itself, as a reality that reconstitute life uh, within that context, uh, rather than just seeing as an example of, of a larger system. So I'm not only providing this, this case as, a, as, a, as an example of what, what is going on somewhere else, because then, then it, it all remains as an example for something like a meta-narrative. So the meta-narrative is important. So for example, let's talk about even capitalism, right? So that meta narrative is important because it happens in different contexts, but each context also reconstitute the context and it reconstitute the life situations for those who are affected by it. Uh, so therefore I try to capture it through um, sort of a human centric analysis of, of, a, of an economic crisis. Okay, um, so I start, by, uh, so I, I have an introduction where I talk about um, contextualizing the crisis within the history of plantation capitalism mm -hmm. um, through different labor regimes that occurred in different periods. Um, uh, it starts with the intentured system because in India, that's when the plantations uh, were established, post-slavery plantations. Then it goes through different kinds of labor regimes through Kankani Sadari systems uh, in the 30s, 40s to wait in the post-colonial context. Um, and I also uh, bring in, um, for example, how, um, so one of the major concerns uh, in relation to the economic crisis is what is happening to these workers in terms of their identity uh, categories. Uh, so I not only see them as a working class population within plantation, but also I try to look at different kinds of categories of identity, including ethnicity, gender, and, and more importantly, I look at caste. Um, so in the introduction, as well as uh, in the in the first chapter, um, I, I, I in the in the, in the introduction as well as in the first chapter, I look I look at uh, what was caste in the context of plantation, because caste system is so huge that can we reduce it just as an element of plantation production? Uh, can we reduce 
the potency of caste system as just as an aspect of capitalistic production within which you know caste just like gender is employed by capitalist within the capitalist system to reproduce itself of course that's important but that's one aspect of the way caste operates within the plantation uh, so in this chapter uh, titled uh, the making of a moral order i look at what was plantation before the crisis so i also um, did uh, field work before the crisis but also i was born and brought up in plantation so i have a a uh, fairly decent idea about the kind of moral order I'm talking about and why I um, titled it as a moral order uh, rather than production order because I tried to look locate the production order within the sort of moral order uh, in the plantations. Um, so I tried to look at both the, these, the, these sort of processes that uh, uh, becomes a function of reproducing uh, plantation production but that cannot be reduced just to factory uh, factories and fields. Okay, it cannot be reduced to workplace because uh, the workers are uh, uh, they are living within the structure of plantation. Um, so I try to look at uh, I, I try to look at for example how caste operates within this sort of class order. Okay, so I try to bring in how for example caste uh, operates uh, very differently from uh, conventional Indian villages. Um, so I talk about how, for example, uh, certain ritualistic aspects of caste is suspended within plantation. And what does caste mean in plantation? It is not same as caste in, in the villages. So there is a, a, a huge shift in the meaning and, and, and what, does it, what does we mean by caste goes through uh, radical transformation as these workers move from the villages to the plantation. So I look at the, the, the particular nature of uh, caste uh, within the uh, class order. Then I also expand the um, the potency of ca categorical, uh, the, these categories of identity in relation to the reproduction of plantation as a system through what I call as categorical oppression and the alienation of these workers. Okay, so by which categorical oppression, I meant how the categories or category, categories of identity within the plantations reinforces each other in, in reproducing uh, not only the plantation production, but also the alienated life of workers. So one of the, uh, in, in addition to this categorical oppression, where I try to see uh, the sort of social location of these workers beyond the plantation. So it, it cannot be reduced to them just being workers, yeah. So I also relate it to different kinds of alienation. So in this context, for me, alienation in a Marxist sense is as important as alienation in a Fanonian sense. Uh, so I try to bring in what, what often uh, mutually uh, reinforcing aspects of alienation, economic, social, and, and cultural. So I look at how, for example, how through a particular kind of moral economy, uh, graded patronage within the plantation, how it reinforces uh, the, the alienation of the workers, uh, but also how that alienation uh, it becomes a very central condition for their life. So alienation is also not just an aspect of production. It's just something that reproduces the workers, but it reproduces them as human beings also. Uh, so, uh, so I try to explain, also discuss ethnographically, uh, how, for example, this idea of alienation is very central, not only to the way they talk about the crisis, but also the way they experience life itself. Yeah, so they are alienated both within the plantation production, but also they are alienated outside because they are located at the bottom of categorical relationships both within the plantation, but also outside. So the violence, is not just about the capitalistic plantation order, but also the violence is there in the way they are located in the uh, hierarchy of categories of identity in outside the workplace. So they are Tamil speaking uh, Dalits, mostly women. Uh, so uh, their Tamil identity, Dalit identity, uh, they're them being working in plantation, but also living in highlands. So there are different meanings attached to 
language, ethnicity, uh, region, space, etc. So it, it finds particular kind of meaning and expression in these contexts. Uh, and these all reinforces and, and further stigmatize them. Uh, and that, that is a sort of terrain in which you have a sort of blurred boundary between production relations and larger social relationships. And also that is a sort of blurred area in which they, uh, they bring in the sort of alienation by which they can't differentiate the sort of alienation as being workers within a capitalistic system uh, versus alienated within the sort of larger caste social order. Um, <clears throat> uh, so, yeah, so in, the, in this chapter also I discuss, uh, for example, how uh, plantations remain as a unique uh, production site different from uh, ordinary factories outside the plantations, uh, pl plantation uh, belt. Um, I mean, there is a big debate around the question of uh, plantation being a total like institution, whether plantation is really like mines, for example, is it like an insulated institution or it's just like an ordinary village because you also find workers all the time going out and coming in, etc. But I try to argue for uh, plantation as a total like institution uh, in a very relative sense because it's quite different from uh, ordinary uh, village society in India. So therefore, I try to look at the uniqueness of plantation system and how that affects the worker's life rather than just seeing what are the sort of similarities of plantation structure with the village uh, society outside. Um, in the second chapter, um, I look at What's happening to, so I, I the, the sort of first three chapters after my first chapter is about workers, the youth and the retirees. So I try to look at uh, different categories of population within plantation and how the economic crisis affects them differently. Um, so in this chapter, I look at the sort of active workforce and uh, I talk about how um, uh, it affected like two kinds of workforce. One who stayed within the plantation despite the crisis, uh, who tried to make a livelihood by just commuting to uh, 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 to other um, factories or uh, build, uh, agricultural sites outside the plantation for work. Uh, but also they uh, tried to um, uh, they, they they tried to retain their housing within the plantation. Okay, so there is another group. So this is a group I'm staying, I'm calling stay on group. And then there is another group who move out of the plantation. So they go back to uh, cities, different cities within India. They go back to big industrial sites in Kerala um, and as well as in, uh, they go back to their villages of social origin. So for example, they, uh, many of them went to um, um, textile in textile belt in uh, Tirupur, Coimbatore, uh, in South India. And I, I followed them and I tried to look at uh, their livelihood strategies in, in, the new work in their new workplace and what's happening to them. So one of the sort of um, argument that I try to bring in here is that it's not that simply these workers move from one crisis to another. It is that the work is continually moving from through through different sort of spectrum of crisis. So you have a sort of uh, so so for example, the workers from the plantation they go the, they go to these textile centers when there is a crisis when some uh, factories are shut down, uh, then they move somewhere else. Um, so I look at the um, footloose nature of their migration in relation to the uncertainties uh, and precarity generated by crises. So it's not only then plantation crisis, but they end up in as, as a very precarious workforce somewhere else. And from there then continuously had to move around uh, as, a, as a sort of very liminal, uh, as a liminal population. So it's not only a footloose labor, but as a liminal population who can't es establish even a social relationship, social life, in any of these contexts. So that kind of liminality uh, feeds into them being as alienated workers. 
Um, uh, the, the, the third chapter deals with the retirees in the plantation. Uh, so this is a group of, of, of workers who worked in the plantation for 40 years or more. Uh, and and uh, even as a child laborers, they started to work in the plantation, maybe when they were like nine years, 10 years old. And they, they continued working there until they turn around uh, 58, age of 58, uh, more than 40 years of work labor on the plantation. And the only hope they had is that once they retire from the plantation, uh, they get a gratuity amount. Okay, so until then you can't save. It's it's in in the plantation they call it uh, not inherited wealth, only inherited debt. So you only inherit debt, and you also only pass on debt. So this gratuity, getting a gratuity and service payout, is a moment when you actually reduce this inherited debt. So it's it's much more powerful. Um, it it has a powerful presence more than you know, these uh, 400 or 500 pounds they would get. It, it roughly translates to 40,000, 50,000 rupees earlier. Now maybe like one lakh rupee, which is nor, which is around 1,000 pounds, okay? Um, so I look at uh, the context in which the retirees experience uh, the crisis and their inability to have access to the gratuity. So what happens, what happened in the plantations? Most of the plantation companies just abandoned, abandoned the plantations and just left the workers on the plantations and including retirees. So many of them are yet to get uh, the gratuity from, uh, from these companies. And no one made really accountable, made these companies accountable uh, for what they have done to their workers. So you, what do you have, you know, so what you have is a high sort of impunity capital. Uh, just as the footloose labor, what you have is a sort of footloose capital who can just, you know, extract uh, from the plantation until they want, then they can just move to somewhere else where they find cheaper labor and cheaper capital. So uh, so, so I, I, I look at not only sort of economic consequences of not having access to the service payouts these workers hoped for, but what does it actually do to them? So I look at the social meaning of gratuity uh, that uh, that evolved over a period of time in plantation. What does gratuity mean? So gratuity for a retiree means respect. I mean, that is in many contexts, right? But so in particularly in a very insulated, relatively insulated total like system of plantation, uh, even your social life, and the sort of meanings you attach to your social culture and even to kinship uh, is highly connected to plantation production. So you are respected within the plantations only if you have your gratuity service payouts by which you can participate in your kinship network. So for example, if you need to attend a wedding, uh, a ritual, you have to have money, you have to contribute money, but as a retiree, you are expected to contribute. Uh, you have some money with you, right? It's also uh, produce. It's also about not only about respect, but also about dignity. So your dignity is very much attached to, you know, the, the gratuity service payouts, etc. As a retiree, um, so I, I look at uh, different uh, case situations in which uh, the retirees talk about not only not having access to gratuity but also how to stay on in the plantation. So there is also a struggle to stay on in the plantation um, because unless you have gratuity, uh, you can't just, you know, you, I mean, you have, it, there's also a sort of contract within a kinship system, right? I mean, you pay and you, you stay on, um, but then of course they can stay on with their, um, with their children, but then they feel themselves as, uh, as not only as alienated being, but as a failed being. Um, and, and they try to project the failure of plantation onto themselves. So it's not at the end of the day, becomes a failure of plantation as a system, but failure of yourself because you couldn't live a life that you hoped for as you toiled for more than 40 years of uh, plantation. So um, the some of, the people that I interviewed and I uh, 
uh, did participate in observation way, um, they, they died without uh, seeing their gratuity. So there are like, um, it's it's very tragic because that is one thing that they really hoped for that um, they get their gratuity before they die. Okay, so they sort of, you see a uh, very uh, painful uh, narrative. So there is a sort of agony in, in grief, right? So grief, is, is, is about different kinds of loss. So I talk about the uh, not having access to gratuity as a, as a loss that you grieve about. Um, so, um, yeah. Uh, the fourth chapter discuss the situation of the plantation youth who were, uh, at least some of them, were potential plantation workers. Let's say if the crisis uh, did not happen, they would be employed, uh, at least part of them, or in the plantation. So I look at what's happening to um, these youth as they move out of the plantation. So of course, I mean, in the plantation, um, the plantation is not a very desired, plantation, being a plantation labor is not a desired work, right? I mean, it's because it's very much contrary to your own ideas of mobility. So that idea is there. So Many uh, children try, try to move out of the plantation, but many are also stuck within the plantation. But, um, but what happens in the crisis context is that even people who plan to stay on until the plantation, they can't stay on, they have to leave. So I look at their struggle as they move out of plantation um, uh, uh, and, and enter into situations uh, which they are not very much familiar with or experienced with. Uh, so, so this is also to do with plantation in a very relative sense as a total like institution, because many of them are born, brought up in the plantation. And some of them, of course, have gone for uh, higher uh, studies outside the plantation, there where they sort of encounter a life outside the plantation. In the plantation, you don't have the kind of diversity that you see outside. Um, so I, I look at uh, what happens to these youth in the, in the context of not only not having what you could call as a kind of functional literacy of living through these new workplaces, new uh, towns, but also what kind of, you know, um, how they are placed within new categories of identity, categorical relationship in this urban context. So earlier I mentioned about how, for example, caste as an institution, as an as also as a category of identity, goes under transformation from village to the plantation. But also similar things happens from plantation to new sites of uh, production, new places where these workers end up in. Right. So they have to navigate through different um, categorical relationship. By which I meant the uh, categories, uh, the, the sort of hierarchical location of people within each category. So for example, if caste is a category of identity within the categorical relationship, where are you located? Okay, let's say for example, uh, being identified with a particular kind of ethnicity. So how you are located within this sort of hierarchy of ethnic categories as understood within a particular society. So I look at the way uh, these plantation youth are located in different contexts and also I, I stayed uh, with some of them in different uh, cities in, in Kerala and in Tamil Nadu. Uh, and, and I tried to locate them within how many of them actually end up in, um, in, in plantation-like structures in the urban context, like in ghettos. Um, so although they don't talk consciously about being moving from plantation to um, lower caste settlements only where they find uh, housing. Uh, but I try to locate it structurally and I try to understand it through what I call as hidden injuries of caste. So as, as they move out of plantation because of economic crisis, then they, they enter into different kinds of social crises. One is to encounter uh, categories of identity which are much more stigmatized outside the plantation. So in this context, uh, being a, a Dalit uh, is uh, relatively uh, less stigmatized compared to outside the plantation. So this I also discuss uh, in the 
in this chapter how for example there is there is certain idea of egalitarianism uh, egalitarian relations that exist within a very inegalitarian and very oppressive uh, structure of uh, production um, but so what happens to these youth these retirees who have to move out of the and, and also to the workers who have to encounter different kinds of reality and and, and a caste system that is much more dehumanizing uh, and violent than the one that you find within the plantation. So that's what I call as hidden injuries of caste. So I talk about how, for example, the plantation youth encounter caste in urban context as they move, migrate to, for example, industrial township in Tamil Nadu. How, for example, the retirees, uh, I also talk about a case where they migrate back to the Tamil villages. Uh, and and in, in, a, in a very paradoxical sense, ironical sense, um, it's, you know, caste oppression was one of the reasons why their ancestors migrated to plantation. Okay, and, and now they are actually migrating, returning back to these villages uh, where they are not familiar also with the moral order, the caste moral order of a, of a village. So they talk about how, for example, they end up making mistakes, but also how they experience the pain, pain uh, of, of being a Dalit more than the local uh, village Dalits uh, because they, they, they haven't experienced uh, this kind of uh, caste back in the plantation. Um, uh, so earlier I mentioned about how, for example, the workers move from one crisis to another in terms of economic crises. So for example, the crisis that happens uh, in textile industry uh, affects for, for them, then they move back to uh, villages or, or other sites uh, of production for livelihood. Uh, in this chapter uh, titled Damned in Dispute, I talk about how a dam conflict, uh, a conflict over a dam between two states within South India affects these workers as they move out of the plantation. So I talk about uh, this, the case of Mullapiriyar Dam, which is located between Tamil Nadu and Kerala and uh, a huge controversy around that and how that affects these workers being a Tamil speaking minority in Kerala. Um, so I look at the context in which how they end up being the Tamil in the context of the crisis, the Tamil to be targeted on. So that being an authentic Tamil in Kerala means you embody certain kind of racist uh, stereotypes of being a Tamil, right? I mean, in, a, in different context, when, uh, when, uh, when, when someone locates you, mostly in relation to the race, racial stereotypes, caste stereotypes, right? So here in this context, the Tamils, uh, the, the, the Dalit Tamils becomes the authentic Tamils to be targeted. And the upper caste Tamils are not considered so as, as Tamils. So let's say, you know, if you're, let's say English, you're going to Amsterdam, the kind of stereotypes you encounter is not in reference to the upper class English. It's mostly working class English. And it's in all contexts you find that the, the, the those who actually experience the brunt of racist stereotype are the people who are located at the lowest level of, of, of that society, right? So I, I look at how, for example, these plantation crises within the tea belt um, pushes them outside the plantation where they encounter not only other economic crises, but also encounter um, discrimination based on their identity categories, but also structural sort of violence that is subjected upon them for being identified as, as the most, you know, most authentic people to be targeted, you know, in a very, very negative sense, not, not in a very positive sense. Uh, but also I talk about in Tamil Nadu, how they are, how they are identified as not so authentic. Okay, so for example, in Tamil Nadu, um, where uh, Malayalam speaking minorities uh, from Kerala were targeted. And because they were in Kerala, these plantation workers for generations, they have a slight Malayalam accent in the Tamil also. They use certain Malayalam words for which they were targeted in Tamil Nadu. So they are, they are identified 
uh, as you know, in the most violent structure, as as the most authentic Tamil to be targeted in Kerala, and in Tamil Nadu being most unauthentic Tamils to be targeted. Uh, so you have different lenses of uh, violence they are subjected upon. Um, in the sixth chapter, I discuss uh, what I call as crisis of relations. Um, so I, I meant I, I briefly discussed about the egalitarian relations uh, that existed as part of the plantation model order before the crisis, um, and and this, and it's it's all in a relative sense. And uh, um, I also discussed in the first chapter about a kind of harmonious relationship that existed among workers because. Mostly what you are, you're all like tea workers at the end of the day, and you all make very similar wage. But in the crisis context, so much differentiation is, is going on. So one differentiation is what I call as politics of decency, is how the workers themselves, uh, as they move out of the plantations, have access to different levels of income and different uh, qualities of life. Uh, it, it's slight, it, it, it is not huge, but for the workers, that sort of differences are so stark that they try to use it for their own advantage to get a higher status back in the plantation. So I, I call it as a sort of politics of decency. Um, but I also talk about uh, the institutions that replace plantation, uh, plantation system. So for example, as part of plantation system, you have access to uh, basic healthcare. You have access to a primary health health center. As it's shut down during the crisis, uh, new, um, uh, you know, very radical religious movements of, of different kinds enters into the plantation in the tension of helping the workers uh, with uh, medical help, uh, with providing uh, free. Uh, evening tuitions, a free evening training uh, to the plantation children. And they, I try to look at um, how these institutions uh, of, of different religious, religious denomination try to occupy the space created, the vacuum created by the plantation uh, regime, uh, and how that further divides the workers. And, and I also talk about how, for example, trade unions uh, themselves have divided the workers uh, because in the in the crisis during the crisis period uh, the, the the trade unions divided the tea fields as these plantation companies just vanished they divided the tea fields among themselves based on union membership trade union membership so if you are part of a particular kind of union you are part of a sort of cooperative field tea field in which uh, you try you spend more time right so it becomes it becomes a basis not only for a cooperative setup within the tea fields, but also it became a center of it became a central element of group formation outside the tea fields. In to the extent that you, you had uh, there were reports of violence between uh, trade union members, uh, uh, different trade unions. So uh, I I try to look at how this crisis also leads to further crisis and one really. Uh, one, one particular example of this crisis also comes at the end of almost um, at the end of the economic crisis in which um, some uh, few plantations uh, were reopened uh, when, when new companies took over these plantations. So I have another chapter talking about these new companies and what they did just they randomly by divide the plantations. Okay, so let's say if uh, the region from Stepney Green Station. Here, it's a single plantation. It's not just a plantation for tea production, but also then you have a village that uh, evolved as part of that production. But suddenly, new company, two companies, so one company sell this plantation to two companies, putting a line in between. So it not only divides the tea fields, it entirely divides the workers as a village. So then the, these, village, these uh, workers from two sides of this boundary were fighting for the ownership of the temple, the common temple, because you had only one temple. So who will own the temple? Now, if one person dies on, on, uh, on one side of, 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 the, of, of, of the plantation, will there be uh, uh, 
you know, holiday for the entire plantation. It can't happen now because it's two different companies. So earlier you have a system by which if someone dies in the plantation, well, you, you, you won't have work in the, uh, that particular day in the plantation. Now, if someone dies here, if that road uh, just outside the building is the boundary, the, the person who is, who is on the other side were forced to go to work. And that is something like a huge violence against two these workers. I'll hurry up. Ten minutes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, being an anthropologist, uh, you know, I also talk about some very conventional and uh, topics in anthropology of, of gossip and rumor. Uh, but I try to talk in relation to the plantation production because. Um, when you are in the most vulnerable position, you relate too much on gossip and rumor that we see, right, in a conflict situation. And historians uh, from from E.P. Thompson and others have talked about the, the role of the functional role, function of uh, gossip and rumor in uncertain contexts. And and uh, and an economic crisis being so uncertain that I used to encounter so many gossips, so many rumors. Uh, and particularly in relation to um, the transfer of ownership and, and the possibility of new companies taking over the plantation, that I was so confused whether it's real or not. So I don't know whether it should go into my notebook, right? I mean, as, as something, okay. So many workers will tell me, and many, like, not only workers, even people who are at this sort of managerial position would tell me that, you know, a new company is going to take over the plantation next month. Okay, so it's also, you know, plantations uh, are regions where you also get a lot of tourists. So they may see a tourist vehicle at a distance and they would say that, oh, this is from Ta Tata Group or Ambani or Adani who are, who are going to, you know, are just looking at the plantation and uh, they are going to take over. So I, I try to look at these sort of functional aspects of rumor and gossip uh, in, 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 in this moment, uh, particularly as a, as a as an element of reproducing um, the crisis uh, situation rather than as an element of, element that is emancipatory because uh, gossip is also understood as, as an element of uh, emancipation, as something part of resistance, as a hidden uh, strategy of resistance, in, also rumor. But I try to look at the uh, other aspects of rumor and gossip in this, in this context. Um, so in, in the second last chapter, I talk about uh, what happens when uh, the new companies um, are uh, taking over plantations. So this happens over like 20 years period I'm talking. Um, so the new companies, which I also call as new generation companies, they have a very different orientation uh, and, and style and, and, and ideas about plantation and what they do want to do with plantation especially when there is so much uh, 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 scope for uh, real estate business so uh, in, in the plantation context. Um, so I look at, you know, what is, the, what is the nature of these new companies? And also uh, I talk about uh, the new workforce uh, who were replacing the tumblers. So once these new companies taking over the plantation, they try to bring in workers outside uh, from, from a region which is not uh, from the traditional conventional source of labor for plantation, which was Tamil Nadu. So this time they were bringing workers from Central India and Central Eastern India. Um, and so I tried to look at this new workforce uh, who are in a much more precarious position than the Tamils because they are completely retained as, a, as casual labor. Um, so there is increasing casualization of labor, and and I also uh, discuss it in relation to the this ongoing undermining of progressive labor laws uh, that were passed between nineteen let's say forties to seventies. You you find series of laws, labor laws, very progressive for for the time, and they are undermined. Now they are also undermined uh, structurally, legally, because uh, you know the sort of current government has scrapped those laws and are coming up with a very neoliberal uh, uh, law regime in relation to labor. 
but apart from that, I also talk about how these new companies make use of the crisis to casually reproduce these uh, these workers. So what you know, so I look at their um, their narrative. What is the discourse of this new company? What they call a social cost of production, and also the discourse of state itself. So everyone. Again, going back to the point about in a crisis moment, you are concerned, concerned so much about the commodity, not about the people. Then what happens is everybody is talking about how to become competitive in international tea market. Therefore, we need much more cheaper labor in, internally. And, and, and therefore, you saying the crisis as another reason to further perpetuate crisis in the life of the workers. Uh, so I talk about this sort of detachment and uh, sort of gap between the real crisis where, versus lived crisis, uh, where the lived crisis, of course, uh, is a real crisis because the workers are also not told whether, you know, the, the plantations, uh, how does, for example, uh, tea is doing, Indian tea is doing in international market, right? The workers are fed uh, with, they are uh, supplied with certain ideas of crisis. So, so that they can be reproduced as the most, uh, as, as the cheaper labor force. So um, casualization of labor is, is, is illegal within the plantation context, but the companies were doing it as, as, as in, a, in a context of exception. And, and they have also negotiated with state machineries because there are also state labor uh, departments who look after the legality and illegality of labor relations within plantation, and 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 uh, so I, I talk about this sort of informal um, relationship that exists between the plantation companies and state machineries in perpetuating these workers as as uh, casual labor. Uh, in the last chapter, I uh, rather than just going back and summing up uh, what I have discussed in the book. I uh, try to think more in relation to anthropology of crises. So how can you talk about, you know, from ethnography of, uh, of a, ethnography of a crisis situation, um, what sort of analysis are possible, uh, which goes beyond, uh, you know, concern for commodities, concern for the tea sector, Right, uh, so I tried to conceptualize what I call as social consequences of uh, crises uh, in, the, in the in the in the in the context of economic crisis in the plantation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. No worries. Okay. Thanks so much, Jay, uh, for that presentation and for taking us through your book and really kind of almost making the it come alive, at least at least for me. Um, so we have about 20 people online and about a similar number here. Uh, so what we'll do is I'll I'll kind of take turns, I'll take one round. Uh, in person and then um, and then go online. So please bear with me while I'm kind of alternating uh, questions at both ends. Also, uh, I, I, I should have said uh, before we started that uh, um, uh, Amod, who's based at ISS The Hague, is uh, helping me to run this in a, hybrid, in a hybrid version. He's also a colleague at the Journal of Agrarian Change. And also to thank uh, Elena, who's a co-director of CLASP and helped support this um, event. Um, so, um, yes, so uh, maybe I'll I'll just, while people are gathering their thoughts, I'll just start with a, maybe it's, it's, it's just a kind of clarifying question. Um, is, um, so you, you, you started by saying that there's a kind of, uh, you talk about the moral order, not just the production order, but also the moral order. And uh, I just wondered if you could kind of say, uh, you know, how do you, you talked obviously in that one of the later chapters about uh, how the relations are differentiated now and there's kind of what you call a politics of decency. But I wonder if you see that as changing the moral order of caste or do you see that as a kind of higher level, more stable kind of order? And, uh, you know, caste. and, and something. 
yeah within within the plantation or, or without however you interpret it um so do you want to start by that while people uh can I, mean, uh, I don't know if you speak from can you okay, speak, uh, yeah. okay maybe we can both can uh, uh, Shreya, can... maybe you can move the mic towards the other side i don't know okay if, is, uh, if, if i move works. the mic here can you can you sit and speak no Sorry, it's okay i can do... stand yeah maybe yeah it's like this right or yeah do you want to yeah okay we, yeah you can you can you let you that side or... okay can i move yeah, because sure. you have yes. to speak okay. more than yes. hopefully more than i will speak okay. and uh, yeah i mean uh, this concern for a moral order it's mostly for anthropology audience um, because uh, we we you know we talk a lot about moral economy as something uh, ant antithetical to political economy you know, as moral economy within villages. I mean, and it's a kind of also in relation to all economic anthropology. Um, so I try to look at how, uh, you know, I mean, the moral economy that also exists within political economy, but also goes beyond that. Because it goes beyond that, because it's also the basis upon which these workers live their life. Mm -hmm. So if you have a concern, if you keep the, cons the workers at the center, uh, beyond the mass workers in a way. Also, you have concern for how the whole production of moral economy and them being part of that moral order uh, is central to how they live their life. So it's a, there's a sort of phenomenological concern here. And uh, the, the later part of, uh, you know, politics of decency and, and, its trans and, and how, for example, caste transforms in the context of uh, the crisis, I, I discussed then, you know, discuss in the chapter uh, crisis in relations, where I, where, where I talk about uh, how um, these new, insti new religious institutions uh, that, uh, that enters into the plantation reconstitute caste relations. So you, what happens before is that even although you have a very class order um, compared to caste sort of order outside the plantation, um, the workers, it is sort of endogamy uh, was caste based. So, workers from a particular subcaste married. Okay. So, in the new context, as religious organizations were getting uh, more prominent, they were actually trying to encourage workers from different subcaste, Dalit subcaste, to intermarry. Mm -hmm. So, I have a section called, uh, I think, Pentecostalism and Disruptive Endogamy try to look at how, for example, this new group formation is possible only when the uh, this organization powerfully enters into caste because caste is so rigid that it 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 has sort of natural as a, it, it becomes a natural central element for group formation. But if you want to counter it, you have to counter through you know disrupting the kind of endogamy which exists. So of course it, it is changing in that so. Great. Uh, I think we have a question from Amit. Actually, why don't you sit here and maybe we can go next. Hi. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. 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 Uh, thank you so much for your paper and I'm very much looking forward to reading your book. My question has to do with the relationship of caste and class. So it, it seems to me that one of the interesting arguments you're making is that caste identity is negotiated differently from the plantation to outside the plantation. And that caste identity is a central formation of, uh, of resistance happening. How is this playing into, is, is class identity a similar kind of formation or is there some difference around caste formation of identity and class? Is class an identity or is class somehow differently? The experience of it is different. Right? This, I just want you to see if you can elaborate. Within plantation. Within and outside the plantation, because it seems like you're talking about both. Yeah. No, I mean, in the plantation, the class is also made sense through caste in a way, but not in the way as in a, as in a village outside. So what I meant is that, you know, two people talking about the shared experience being in a very similar position. There is, of course, they are part of similar, uh, I mean, they are part of uh, sim same production relations located at, at, a, at a similar level, right? I mean, they are workers, but they might try to talk through the caste terms also. Uh, so then it is also the question of, you know, you are in, you are in plantation, 
Is it because you are working class or is it because you are a Dalit? You can't separate that. So that is a difficulty when you do ethnography because analytically it's very hard to um, you know bring out what do they really mean by you know, of course they're fuzziness here. Yeah. Um, but I have another paper uh, on on a women workers strike where I talk about how, for example, these th these two th two things coexist because in the book I talk about the production and moral order in, a, in, in together because they because of the blurred boundary and that also exists uh, for the workers action, right? I mean, do they do they come together? Is it because they are from because of class consciousness or because of caste consciousness. So it's very hard to say. But the, the point is to uh, bring out what is so particular. How does it operate in this context? Great. Thanks. Uh, I think Elena. Yeah. Um, and I think it's very closely related to what we have said, but thank you very much for I'm looking forward to reading the book. <laughs> So I was interested in this contradiction that you mentioned that the plantation being a per se very violent institution, but in this violence, there is a boundary of the plantation that breaks from egalitarian uh, identity. And I was wondering if, if in this move that that egalitarian uh, identity or experience reflects back in any forms of collective resistance other than the individual resistance of moving out, escaping the plantation in this moment of uh, crisis. One and two, if there's any gender dimension uh, uh, in 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 the workforce, in experiencing this egalitarian, or also in 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 in, um, in the forms of resistance, um, or in differentiation among men and women. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe one more question we can take. Yes, do you want to? Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, can I encourage you to speak as loudly as possible too? <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, first, uh, it's 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 really a joy to listen to 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 Jay's presentation. I mean, who who else can can present on plantations in this manner? So knowing the historical depth through his own life and through many many years of study. So 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 great thanks thanks for for giving us this presentation. Now. Uh, I, I have a, sort of a question that relates a bit to the moral order, which I, I don't think is only for anthropologists for, the, for, for that tribe. But I think what what you do so well in the book uh, it is to show that people, uh, so, uh, plantation workers, consider themselves as having had rights, having had certain entitlements to a permanent job, to, to housing, to some sort of health care, schools for their kids, and, and how this is this is collapsing as a, as a result of, of the crisis. So, so I wonder, where does that leave the, 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 old, the old plantation workers, the young ones, the new plantation workers that are coming in? What do they consider their rights today? when the old order doesn't exist the way the old moral order doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. Have they maintained that feeling of this is our rights, or has that changed to we have no rights anymore? Yeah. So I'll start with Elena's question on resistance. Um, Jay, a bit loudly, just yeah. put the mic in. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm trying so, to think. That's Elena's <laughs> Oh. Okay, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, one question I encountered um, uh, in the in as a, as a response to this book and a response generally to my uh, my research in a, in a way is why I talk more about alienation rather than agency of work. So, uh, so one is, um, you know. Like you have a formal channel for uh, industrial action, which is trade unions. 
and I also explained the scandal of trade unions implantation. It's, it's very correct. Okay, and they are very much part of institutional setup. And I, I, I classify them as part of the plantation regime, I call us, like the state, the company, and the unions. And also most of the union leaders are not from these communities. They are like professional uh, union leaders who make a like, uh, living by being a union. And they are outside. So, uh, so what sort of industrial action possible institutionally uh, depends on the unions. Now, if the unions are also reinforcing the company's narrative about crisis, the company narratives about, you know, uh, in a way living through. So I explain how living through the crisis becomes a patriotic act because you have to live through being a casual worker in the new context uh, because that's the only way these tea companies can compete with the international market. So these sort of nationalistic discourses that were centered around industrial progress, industrial revolution in different contexts also happened with plantations, not only in India, for example, in the uh, Tanya Lee's book on plantation life in Indonesia. Uh, she discussed about how it, it is very connected to the nationalistic discourse. So being participant, you know, being a plantation worker is being like an in army, you're like serving the country, right? So yeah, the unions also produces two kinds of narrative. One is the nationalistic narrative about plantation and plantation being central to national development, but also talk about inevitability, inevitability of plantation, very much a neoliberal discourse on why it is so inevitable. So if, if you don't have plantation, you mean you lose this job. So what they argue for, I mean, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm, I'm writing an article on deproductivization discourse because but one thing is that they are always concerned about the workers, retaining workers as workers. They never think about, for example, subjecting plantation for land reform. So why I'm saying all these things, there is a very structural, you know, sort of rigid structural aspects of institutionalized resistance. Now, uh, you know, wildcat strikes were possible. And strikes are possible also only when they go outside the unions and against them. And that happened in, in the plantation context, not in this plantation belt I'm talking about, in another one, where the workers organized not only outside the unions, but also against them. And where they have this kind of solidarity, that uh, this sort of egalitarian relationship, that bondedness that exists within the plantation uh, facilitated them going against um, against the company and the, against the unions. And that brings the second concern, which is the gen gender is so central to plantation. I mean, I talk mostly about caste, but I explain, for example, on the gender division of labor, but also how, uh, you know, social reproduction of uh, households is very much, of course, connected to the uh, plantation production. And majority of the workers are, uh, are women because the tea plucking is a central activity and in the gender division of labor, the tea pluckers are, 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 are mostly women. And these, these, interestingly, the resistance I, I talked about just now were led by me. Uh, it's completely led by me. And the group was called Pembele Women, Women's Unit. So these two questions are uh, very much connected. And, uh, and in terms of experiencing, um, the egalitarian and inegalitarian relationship, of course, uh, gender becomes also very key thing. Um, I explained um, also in a new article how, for example, certain possibilities which are available for men were not accessible for women. Uh, for example, like, uh, you know, the, the, the hours of work for men is very different, not only task, but also hours of work is very different. Uh, for so women were much more connected to plantation production but they were detached from the management and the union. So I, I talk about how the detachment from the unions, because although they are union members, were not considered as union members. Yes, you know, as in, in many other contexts, uh, scholars have discussed about uh, class and gender aspects in union activism. And here that facilitated that detachment, what I call as autonomy, facilitated uh, autonomous industrial action against the company and 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 also against me. So yeah. Uh -huh.
and to uh, uh, ancients and uh, yeah so within the new moral order i i have maybe i have to do another field work now on how they are experiencing now but one thing is that um the in the new moral order, you also find absolutely new population who are not connected to the old population. So, for example, the new workers who are brought from Jharkhand, Odisha, and Assam, they are not considered as part of the moral order yet, because there is always they are they are integrated through a buffer. So they are not plantation workers. Also, they are not casual workers of the plantation. They are workers of some contractors. So the, the, the sort of discussion me and Richard, uh, the, the paper on labor contractors. So in a way, within the moral order also, within plantation, they create another enclaves within which they keep the new workers uh, who, who doesn't get to even become part of the moral order of the plantation. So that is about the new workers. For the old workers, they see it as a space of moving somewhere else. So the, the current narrative is that plantation is no more for us. I mean, so the, the, the new new talents who are who are employed there, uh, they try to escape at the earliest chance, and which might not be a good possibility outside. But this kind of uh, talking about a plantation in a in a in in terms of you know kind of in a, in a in a lighter sense of aristocracy of labor, as as Johnny Perry would put it. Is, is not there anymore. Um, and also there is huge disruption in the graded patronage that existed earlier, which was an element of uh, the moral order, uh, because everything is new. Uh, the way, for example, production relations, production was organized has changed so much uh, because of this buffer system that uh, I don't know, I'm not sure if that moral order uh, is reconstituted, it's, it's replaced with something else, I would say. Great. Thanks. Um, so just a reminder for everyone on the I know there's a question on the chat, but I'll, I'll, I'll come to it in a moment. But if you would like to raise your hands to ask something, please do and you, you can, uh, we'll come to you. So um, in the meantime, I think Nina, I, I, sorry, sorry. I just saw the time and I have to leave at oh. 5.30. I'm so sorry. I'm going to email you with <laughs> my questions. That's okay. Sorry. Thanks. Um, I think you had a question. Oh, sorry, I don't know your name. Thomas. Thomas. Yes. Yes. I'm just trying to understand a bit more um, on uh, what we mean by this, this crisis because uh, on the one hand, I understand crisis as a long standing economic downturn that has gone through the years. But at the same time, sometimes you refer to crisis as something uh, that goes uh, towards uh, many sectors. That workers they are uh, they have this constant instability of moving to one factory, one uh, industry, that uh, to the other industry as there's an economic crisis, and this second and um, deeper understanding of crisis um, maybe can even uh, add another layer to what we understand by precarity as well, yeah? because there's a constant sense of insecurity, nothing is standing. Um, so I would just like uh, to listen a bit more on your elaboration about this stage of the society. Thank you. Um, no, that's an interesting question. I mean, you know, I, I mean, I start with an economic crisis, then try to uh, connect it to a series of other crises in different contexts, and also that different contexts meant different things for for these uh, workers um, so uh, in a in a sense i totally agree that there are different layers to it in terms of uh, the, the content and, and and the scale in relation to precarity uh, i mean so one thing i want to be careful uh, is to you know when we use precarity, people also use it as a concept, as something that conditions neoliberal capitalist life, uh, particularly in the Western context. Uh, so I wrote and just published an article in JRI where I try to look at differently in the context of global south. And of course, there are critiques of this sort of precarity in relation to neoliberal life only in the West. 
because in, in many contexts, you know, people had precarious life throughout. Uh, but uh, I try to take uh, one aspect uh, from it and, and try to critically look at it, which is that, you know, uh, people talk about precarity in relation to atomized or in, uh, individualized precariousness. Uh, but I, uh, I try to, you know, although here you find workers moving to different contexts and experiencing, let's say, precarity differently, there is a sureness, uh, which is about mutuality, uh, which is not about atomized individual. Uh, so you, you experience crisis as a community, although you are not closer to each other. And uh, that may be one lens to, through which I want to look at precariousness as, as, as uh, the workers move through different layers of crisis. Okay, great. Thanks. So we'll take the questions from the chat now. So uh, I think we, there is there are a couple of questions. I think the first question is from Siddharth, who is online and has a very long question. Siddharth, you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask if you feel able to uh, do that. Yes, okay, sure. thank you. Hi. Um, hi, hi. Thanks, uh, Jayasilam, uh, for that very interesting talk. My question was just in relation to how the workers in the plantation or how the people in the plantation are seen by the Kerala and the Tamil Nadu state, given that both of them, to some degree compared to other states, have a mandate of some kind of affirmative action. And this was kind of looking at the identity that you spoke about in the damned dispute, which is that, you know, they're neither here nor there. And I was wondering how that comes across in some of the state interactions with demands, etc. And the second was related to the youth moving out and, you know, experiencing, experiencing casteism in education, in cities outside of the plantation. But I wanted to also ask if there was any articulation of their interaction with other cultural movements of Dalit youth, etc., especially from Tamil Nadu, which kind of influenced uh, their thoughts as they came back to the plantation and if there were any articulations of that. Thank you. Um, you want to take those and then we'll take Judith's yeah, after sure. that. Yeah. So, okay. So I respond to it. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that uh, question, <laughs> yeah. Uh Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, the, the first thing is there are plantation workers in Kerala, right? As they move to Tamil Nadu, they are not plantation workers. Of course, there are tea plantations in Tamil Nadu. And uh, and those plantations, for example, there are many which is which are also controlled by the state, uh, state-sponsored plantation for the repatriates from Sri Lanka uh, tea plantations. Um, uh, so, how are they perceived by state? Uh, I'm trying to write something on that in relation to Dalit movements outside the plantation. So, one thing is that although the plantation workers are mostly Dalits. They, were, they are not perceived as Dalits by the Dalit movements outside the plantation uh, because of the cultural, social differences. And, uh, and, and, and uh, of course, and then plantation was, was, was a problem. And, uh, but what happened with the 1915 strike that happened in Kerala, in, the, in Munar plantations? Now there is uh, increasing connections between Dalit movements uh, outside the plantations in Kerala as well as Dalit movements in, in Tamil Nadu broadly. But with regard to the crisis, I uh, I discuss in some section I forgot, is how uh, I, I precisely discuss what you meant, is the workers going back to Tamil Nadu villages uh, end up becoming carers of, for example, VCK, uh, uh, I precisely talk about a case where one guy becomes the secretary of the village. And then he came back, he told me, you know, I didn't know that, for example, uh, suddenly this we did so much uh, for us. So in, it's very interesting because in plantation in, in, in Kerala, you don't find Dalit movements, you don't find Ambedkar statue, for example. So you have a very different, uh, different kinds of levels of bufferness, uh, which channelize the uh, these communities in a particular mode and, and which goes disrupted because of the crisis and because of the strike. Um, thanks so much. Great, thanks. Um, and then we have a question from Judith. Um, Judith, would you like to ask 
your question. Yes. Thank you, thank you very much. Yes, I'm. I'm really firstly wanting to make um, a couple of comments on how I. Th I think this book is incredibly powerful, um, and um, I just want to congratulate Jaya Seelan for having captured so much of both the plantation horror and the casteism. Um, and I, th I think this moving between all these different dimensions and all these different aspects of, of caste, he's, he's done incredibly well. And so thank you, Jaya, for having done all that. Um, and um, I think the, the book comes across incredibly shocking about the way in which the plantation sector is able to walk away from these people whose retirement benefits have never been paid, and how shocking it is that there's no seems to be no political um, route through which uh, the pro protests can be made to get these payments made. But there's many other aspects of the plantation experience which you bring out so well. I, having worked such a lot on caste and casteism um, in Tamil Nadu, uh, thought that this was an incredibly strong um, account of. Um, an argument really against the notion that Tamil Nadu being a progressive state has actually dealt quite well with caste and done quite a lot about caste and has helped Dalits a lot. Because um, the vignettes that you present in this book make it so clear that the, in the strength and the deep-seated feeling about caste and the discrimination that's still taking place in Tamil Nadu, both in villages and in cities, towns, um, is so strong and it's quite interesting to, to, to see that this account of people who in plantations didn't experience it in such a strong way, being so shocked by it when they go back into mainstream society. Um, but the question, I, I just had a, a, a brief question at the end, which was, which was has, the discussion, has there ever been any discussion of the possibility of contract farming for tea in um, this context? Because um, I come from also a long experience in Kenya of having looked at contract farming for tea and the way in which contract farming can work quite positively, at least relatively speaking. And I wonder if that's ever been raised at all in, as a possibility in this context. But thank you very much for a very strong and very rich presentation, as well as a very strong and very rich book. Thank you. Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Judith. Um, thank you. Yeah, I mean, there were discussions of uh, two discussions. One is, of course, contract farming, which they call as cooperative farming. Uh, but also, there is uh, increasing discussion about subjecting plantation to land reforms um, and the workers becoming small scale farmers. And this sort of discussion doesn't come from the established uh, left groups or political parties, but it comes from Dalit movement. So I presented a paper in SOAS two weeks back called Counter Plantation Imaginaries, where I discuss about how the Pemberley Urumai strike translated into counter plantation movement, uh, calling for land reform of plantation land because much of the plantation land is not owned by these companies. Uh, it's, it's leased out to them. It's it's a public land. It's a government land. Uh, so uh, I talk about how, you know connecting to the earlier question on Dalit movements. How, for example, Dalit movements leading the land question in in many contexts. So so I, I have done field work on that, and I, I'd be happy to send that paper to you. Thanks, thanks, Judith. Uh, Steve, you had a question. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask? Um, I think we we might have suddenly lost, we might have mistaken the exit of uh, the meeting. Oh, no, he's, no, he's joining back again. Yeah. Hey, Steve. Can you unmute yourself? Hi, we can't hear you. Sorry. Yeah, I we can't hear you. Do you want to join again or type? Hi, 
if anyone else has a question in the meantime. Does anyone else have a question in the meantime? Anyone else in the online or offline audience? Yes. Yes, <laughs> yes there's a question that, that sort of has been touched a bit upon, but it's never really been on, sort of unpacked here. That is the relationship between the plantation workers and the communist government uh, in, in, in Kerala. Now, we know that the government chose to maintain the plantation sector in private hands when they did land reforms for the rest of the country. We know, you were just saying that it is not the mainstream parties that are pushing for land reforms. Uh, we also know during the strike uh, that you discussed before, uh, uh, the plantation workers certainly did not see the CPM as an ally, or they saw some individuals from that party as, as an ally. But so, what is the policy difference between the way the plantation workers and movements around them would like to see the future, and and sort of the, the dominant parties in in Kerala, which of course the CPM is is very central. Yeah, I mean, um, um, it, yeah, it, it's about the question of what do you want, what do you want for these words, uh, right? I mean, uh, so I, I'm, I'm just, um, you know, in the paper I presented, and so was I precisely discussed this point. That's why I, I titled it as counter plantation imaginaries. It's because what these workers want is land. And there are many questions. I mean, in the last chapter called Social Consequences of Crisis, I also connected to environmental crisis and a landslide uh, that killed 70 workers' families in the plantation. So especially after that landslide, now the workers are demanding more. And, and the idea is to generate more autonomy uh, by becoming um, small-scale farmers. Uh, so it, it feeds into conceptions of mobility. So the workers see, for example, the life changing life situation of the era was the, the dominant middle caste and Syrian Christians on the fringes of plantation who have like small uh, pieces of land. And their life situation in most contexts is much better than the plantation workers. So they always try to relate their own changes, their own ch the changes in their life situation in relation to them and demanding land. So that is very central to it. And I was just checking, for example, also for the paper who had land struggle or land reform in the, at least in the election agenda. And these dominant left parties, they don't have it even in their election. It's only, you know, smaller, like small scale, small, um, parties or Dalit movements who are, who are pushing for it. And therefore, the workers who want, who are, who are actually from the Pembele Uruman movement now are connected to them and try to organize uh, land reform. And, 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 and it's not quite successful yet, but the, the idea is very much clearly there. But the mainstream uh, position is to focus on the wage question and to focus on the workers as workers in a way proletariat. Right? Uh, so the, the, that is the thing. In the plantation, the, the political parties doesn't, they don't intervene directly. They intervene through the unions. Then unions have only a particular kind of focus, which is the wage question, which is the bonus question, which is decent work question. And but that narrow focus entirely defines the relationship between political parties and the workers. So it is not like the workers are connected to both the unions and the party. The party works through the unions and most of the union work leaders becomes, are also party leaders. Uh, so in, in, in terms of the possibility, I don't, I, I mean, in terms of uh, possibility, I don't know, because the the Dalit movements are not very much uh, powerful or institutionalized within the Kerala 
public sphere. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I don't know what will happen, but uh, the 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 imagination for auto uh, resistance is there, uh, but it it is not quite translated. Not actually. It's, and I don't want to say more <laughs> scandalous thing because it's going to be online also. <laughs> okay, thanks, Jay. I think there's a uh, comment by Rajanya which relates to what you were saying, which is that it's fascinating to see how this experience of plantation workers in Kerala is also reflected in the experience in West Bengal and Eastern India with long Communist Party regime, where tribal plantation workers' movements are demanding land reforms and those are strengthening and these mobilizations have also come together under the Adivasi or tribal banners rather than the trade union. So like distancing yeah. themselves yeah. from the trade unions. Yeah. Um, Steve, do you want to try again asking? We still can't hear you. Uh, sorry. Do, do, you, do you want to try just writing? Okay. Okay, sorry, but but you can uh, ask the type if you if you want. <laughs> okay. Um. Any any other questions before? It's also a question from Judith. I think she was asking uh, about uh, uh, which Dalit movements uh, were you talking about, which were interested in land reform. Ah, okay. I think she's uh, Judith has a follow up question. Jay, what Dalit movements are you talking about that are interested in land reform? Are these Kerala specific? Um, and it's difficult to see why is it, it's a problem for mainstream parties. Yeah. Of course it's a problem. Like, <laughs> because who is on the left? Is it really left on the left or on the right? Um, I mean, these are like different. One moment uh, it's called Bhu Adhigara Samrakshana Samadhi. Okay. Um, that's the main organization. And, uh, um, and there are also many others, like, I don't want to name them. Okay. Uh, but I just want to connect one, one point to uh, Insa's question and also the earlier point on the relationship between Dalit movements and the plantation workers. Because the, the plantation land is not only, the question about land reform is not just about the plantation workers. And that's where Dalit movements also enter. Because Dalit movements are also arguing for land for landless Dalits and others outside the plantation. And the, the position or the official uh, position, state position, as well as these parties' position is that you don't have land in Kerala. But then these Dalit movements, they are saying, you have huge plantation. Why don't we subject it for land reform? Which benefits not only the plantation workers, but also thousands of landless families outside. So there is a sort of mutual connection. So it's not just about the... Uh, so, so plantation land is also at the dis at the heart of discourse on land reform outside the plantation, because that is the land which is available for land reform. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, so unless anyone has any other questions, actually, I will abuse my privileges chair <laughs> to ask a final question, which is. Uh, so you ended in that last chapter, and it's just really, you know, it. You had, uh, I think it was started with the plantation or scene, mm -hmm. and it's like it's a huge and debate and you know very current. And I just want to hear your thoughts on what you make of that debate and the term. Um, yeah, I mean, yes, uh, I mean, I, I. I try to keep it as a simple ethnography, but at the end, I try to bring in something very loaded concepts. Um, because, you know, I could have continued like another two, three chapters focusing on the environmental crisis. Where we, and the workers are at the very center of that. But they are so busy, and I was so busy also talking about other crises <laughs> that I couldn't really enter into this. And uh, especially in 2020, uh, seven, as I mentioned, like uh, a landslide in plantation killing 17 workers' families. Uh, then there was question about who is responsible. Is it the plantation company or the state who will, you know, whether because they don't own this place, so whether the state will compensate the plantation companies or the families of these workers. So there's so much questions around that also. So in a way, these crises are connected. Um, yeah. So 
The one thing about plantation or sin uh, is that, of course, people are talking about Anthropocene capital, you know, sin. Uh, there is a racial, anti-racial critique of uh, plantation or sin and, and all these Anthropocene because it, it doesn't bring in right, some race question in the center. So, uh, I mean, one thing was that why many people were interested in the idea of plantation as, uh, as, as to talk about, like, let's say plantation as a sort of metaphorical reference or as a, uh, as a tenet for talking about whatever, whatever happening to human beings, right? Um, so, so in a way, this idea of plantation also uh, attracted the life on the plantations. Also, people are not so much talking about plantations, but about Anthropocene. But I, I was, I was curious. I was interested. How do they make connections between plantation and this sort of disastrous capitalism and the Anthropocene that we are going through? Uh, so that is one connection. Uh, but in terms of the concept, I also bring in the critique of that concept from particularly black radical geographers uh, who criticize, uh, you know, Anthropocene, for example, which makes a very generic assumptions about humanity, humankind. Uh, so what about race, in uh, the role of race in that? So in a way, it, I, I bring in that sort of critique. And, and I think for the Indian context, then you have to bring in for example, caste and other categories in discussing any kind of disastrous capitalism because the sort of its its consequence you have different you know varied consequences for these workers. Uh, so I, I bring caste into that question and I think caste is very central question. Even talking about environmental uh, uh, crisis, ecological crisis. Uh, so there is not so much discussion around that also. So I tried to bring in many things there. So I don't know if it worked. Maybe I have to unpack the book a little more. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. I think we can give them a big round of applause. <laughs> Thanks everyone for joining off the everyone who joined offline and everyone who has joined online. I just want to announce that um our last and final agrarian change seminar will be on uh, Monday, 4th December, 4.15 uh, Dutch time, because it's being uh, posted in a hybrid format through ISS The Hague. And we will have Dr. Inna Hoffman from uh, University of Oxford, who will, giving, who will be giving a talk titled From Seeds of Friendship to Technologies of Resistance, Understanding China's Ambiguous Role in Rural Tajikistan. So um, we hope some of you can join. And thank you. Thanks, everyone.